Welcome to Good Life. I'm Dean Wilson. So glad you've joined us. And you can always find us at goodlifetelevision.org, uh, where we have all the interviews, some great guests. Uh, and we also actually have power clips, which are kind of the the gold, the, the nuggets that we kind of mine of the full interviews. And so it's uh, those are there for you as well. I'm really excited about my guest today. Darcy Hawkshurst is with me. Darcy, welcome. Thank you for having me. Let me just kind of give a quick little introduction, Darcy, on, on kind of your a little bit about your story and what you're doing. But uh, Darcy is uh, helps children. Uh, and, and I'll just give you your website from the start and we'll spell her name so we can get that out of the way. It'll also be on your screen. But uh, DarcyHawkshurst.com is the website. And that is Darcy with an I and then H-A-W-X. H U R S T dot com, and it's real solutions for your child's learning. Uh, this work that Darcy does with with children was born out of her own story, uh, which, in my opinion, is kind of the best kind of work. Uh, and Darcy and I have something in common, which is we're both uh, parents of a child who had a brain injury uh, at some level. And we both found the, the folks at Doman, uh, Doman International, which is an organization in Philadelphia, a nonprofit that helps uh, brain injured children to grow, to develop, to survive, and in and, and, and many, many cases to thrive. So domaninternational.org is their website that they have helped my family in, in, in our situation with our daughter. And they've also been really instrumental in Darcy's life as well. So Darcy, just kind of start with your, your own story, kind of where you grew up and, and then kind of take us to uh, Haley and kind of that chapter. And we'll start from there. Sure, I'm happy to share. Um... You know, to be honest with you, um, much of my life that happened before Haley is not of much interest, except uh, as a contrast point, I think. You know, I was I was a single young woman in college when I had Haley, and um, I, I joke about this when I write in my book, um, my memoir in progress about this story as well, is, is that, you know, I was... Uh, I, my life was full of some complacency, maybe is too strong of a word, but I really didn't have a strong sense of purpose. Um, and so enter, you know, this uh, fiery little Leo baby who came down with um, spinal meningitis at 12 days old. So, you know, imagine this fussy baby in the middle of the night. I was young, I was a new mother, I had, um, you know, some really strong instincts, but not a lot of experience. And so when my mother said, take her temperature, and it comes out to like almost 104, you know, oh. Uh, I'm like, oh, gosh, you know, she's tiny, uh, this tiny little newborn baby with um, a high fever. So, you know, it all was uh, quite a whirlwind of events that ended up with both of us, um, in for a couple of weeks in a hospital, you know, Haley in an incubator full of tubes and wires. Um, lo, those couple of weeks later, uh, she was diagnosed with just this huge list of, of labels already, you know, at, at barely a month old. Um, so it was quite an experience. I mean, we did almost lose her. There was a pretty hairy, scary night with, a, you know, a tired new nurse on duty who couldn't get an IV changed and the seizures wouldn't stop, and no one knew what medication to use. It was already too much medication for a baby of this size, and, um, you know, nobody knew what to do. Um, so, she, yeah, I mean, it was, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a dramatic story, and looking back on it from where I am now, I can see the absolute perfection in the gift of that. Everything unfolded in a way they gave us this tremendous gift um, for Haley to be brain injured. And, in, you know, they named all the different places. I remember that moment in a hospital corridor. My parents were there. Um, some friends were there. And a bunch of people in white coats were trying to explain to me, you know, they're using words I had never heard before, um, talking about all the different places where they had found her brain to be bleeding and all the tests that they had done. And 
nobody knew at that point what was going to happen. They knew what she was at risk for, but they didn't know what was going to happen. And they told me to take her home and raise her like a normal child. I mean, what does that even mean? <laughs> you know? How can I even learn to sleep in a dark room again? You know, I had not left her side. Um, and I think that's where, uh, you know, Haley uh, might disagree with me. Um, this is the, you know, two sides to this coin. But the, one of the gifts of my personality was that I was just tenacious and stubborn. I was too stubborn to leave her side. I wasn't going to the Ronald McDonald house with the other moms to drink coffee. I mean, I, you know, I was sitting there next to this newborn baby in an incubator day upon day and night upon night under fluorescent lighting. And, um, you know, that's just kind of one um example of the stubbornness that I carried because so there we were um, at home you know she's a month old she's got this big bottle of phenobarbital she's at risk for seizures and hearing disorders and visual problems and learning problems and motor problems the list was long and we I felt like it was this ticking time bomb like how was I supposed to know what was going to happen and when and we knew stimulation would be really important for her, but how and what? So, you know, I raised Haley the best that I could with my family's help. And, um, you know, she was adorable and fierce and, and uh, you know, and brain injured, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, brain injured. So by the time she was three, she was not keeping up with her peers. We had tried every early intervention. She was wearing glasses and orthotics and taking, I think, three or four different seizure medicines and having more seizures and having tantrums and not sleeping through the night, you know. So her life was rough, which meant, you know, my life was rough. Mm -hmm. um, so I was a hot mess. I was probably... You know, the stories are kind of funny now, but I was a terrible mother, you know, <laughs> I wasn't pa patient, you know, here's this child and we'll talk more about it um, as we go along, but this child who you take her into a mall or a, a, a grocery store, we learned later, you know, she had auditory hypersensitivity. Mm -hmm. So but the world doesn't know that they're just looking at this strung out mother with this screaming child and we didn't know what to do. So by the time she was four, I found the Doman Method program and took that what to do class and just, you know, our life changed on a dime in that moment because I thought, okay, there is something we can do. And there is a very clear root cause here. It's in the brain. And I was lucky. I was told my child had, you know, a frontal lobe and occipital lobe and temporal lobe damage to her brain. The kids that I work with in my practice may not have had such a dramatic past. You know, they're, they're simply not thriving. They're struggling to learn because their brain's disorganized and nobody knows why. Mm -hmm. So we were very lucky in that way, but it was just not, it was not going to be okay with me. I kept thinking, I, this can't be my life. This cannot be my child. Uh, this is not at all the way I wanted this thing to go. So I cannot not settle for this. Um, some people say to me, oh, you know, you, because we did. So we spent, when she was four, I found the program. It's an intensive treatment program. I mean, I had to learn a lot uh, and quickly, right? And apply it. And so this was years. This was years of intense rehabilitation. And my daughter is in the other room right now. She lives at home for college. She is a university student. She's studying um, entrepreneurship and nutrition science. Yeah, she was at, you know, anatomy lab today trying to get some extra credit points and um, she's doing great. And so that's why it's very important to me to tell this story because so many kids are gonna be left frustrated and struggling. And I remember that life. And I think, you know, people will say to me, oh, you, the gifts that you have, that you are so, um, hardworking or, you know, they want to compliment me on the, the, the qualities of myself that allowed me to do this work. It was long and hard journey, no, no doubt. But it's not as hard as what we were living before or what right. Haley's life now if we hadn't done it, right? But I often, I, I love a good compliment like any anybody, but, you know, the truth is it's a lot of it, a lot of our success I really owe to what I didn't have. And I just didn't have the ability 
to accept that prognosis for her. I just didn't have the ability to not hope it would be better. Mm. So that's what I'm here to tell this story. I mean, my dad would disagree, but I'm not special. Haley's not special. Um, you know, <laughs> this is something that can be done. And it's a change, it's like a paradigm shift. You know, it's a changing of perspective, I think. And it's, um, the truth is I just, I believed in my own belief that it was possible more than I believed anything anybody else said that didn't go with that. So Beautiful. in a nutshell, then that's our story it, it is a story of hope and i'm passionate about spreading that hope because i i believe that i see kids every day i meet children every day that have a similar state of brain disorganization that my daughter had and i i look wistfully at them um thinking that it could be better yeah. you know we can we can make it better and that's not to be disrespectful of where they are right we can make it better right so well, I think there's, what they, try there's, if they had that hope, you know, if they knew it was possible, would they try, right? Yeah. There's so many different questions that that just spurs, but I want to start with just kind of for people who are watching who may not know. So you and I have both been back to Philadelphia to, to see the Domans and with a lot of questions and uh, not a lot of clarity at the beginning. And then what happens is, is you, you, you mentioned the course. So there's a, there's a course that you take as a new person back there, a new person who's involved with the Doman method, the Doman family and the Doman method. And it's a course that basically teaches you about the brain, how it works, how, you know, what um, happens when there are certain injuries and then most of all, what you can do. And then, so I want to say that as a starting point, because that's, it was really amazing for us to, to learn about that. And I'm sure it was for you too, because you go from being, giving all these, you're given all these diagnoses, you're given all these, you know, problems that you don't know how to solve. And then the domains start to teach you about what you can do. And, and, and from that standpoint, it's a, and I think I'm very much like you just hearing you talk. We're doers. Tell me what to do. Tell my wife what to do and we'll do it. The problem was, is when we didn't know what to do. And so they give you a program, you go home and you do it. And in your case, what I was reading about Haley and what she's doing now as an, as a, college student at Indiana University is mind boggling to me from where you started. So I do want to say good job, mom. I know you're not looking for, but it's, it's amazing what you've done and it's amazing what's happened here. But, but I want to focus on one term you used and I'd like you to describe this a little bit more because frankly, you're in this work as well. And so it's great that you're not only a mom, but you're, you're an expert, but you use the term disorganization. And I think sometimes somebody who's watching this, let's pretend, and I just, we're not pretending, but let's say we're talking to a family with a newborn right now, a family that just got home from the hospital or has been home from the hospital for a year or two years. And like you and like me, we had children that were not developing or not developing anywhere close to on time. And so you're kind of just looking at the child and you're kind of going, you know, I had never t heard the term disorganization. I had heard brain damaged. I don't even know if I'd heard brain injured, frankly, but I'd heard brain damaged. I had heard a lot of other terms that are terrible, but I had not been familiar with the disorganization part. Talk about that and how the brain injury, whether it's meningitis in your case, stroke in our case, causes the disorganization that is something that can be fixed which obviously you've done. So walk us through that a little bit. Yeah, this is a wonderful question. I hope I can do it justice in just, you know, a few minutes here. I, um, and you'll see that word disorganization or organization, a program of neurological organization in the Doman Method work. You'll see it, you know, on my website as well, um, because it doesn't matter um, whether it's labels like cerebral palsy, that would be extreme disorganization, meaning the neurons 
Uh, let me back up for a minute. Let me just explain uh, for people who may not have the background that we have uh, what neurons are. So they're tiny little cells um, that have, they, they are, I like to call them a metaphor, the fire bucket brigade, because neurons will pass a message to each other without actually ever touching each other. Okay. And everything that we do physically, everything that we're able to do intellectually or cognitively is um, a result of good coordination or organization of a long chain of neurons passing messages like a fire bucket for grade, like, like tossing those buckets to each other and not spilling water, getting it where it needs to go. And so every movement that we make is, um, you know, and it, through these impulses, these electrical impulses from cell to cell to cell to cell, to the muscles and back to the brain, um, or from parts of the brain to itself. So when those neurons can communicate with each other in a swift and efficient and organized way, then life is pretty good, right? So the process of growth for children from a, from a baby um, in utero, from those cluster of first cells, for goodness sakes, but um, it's all about this growth and connection of networks, of neuronal networks. So if those are organized, if they're working well together, if they know what to do and when to do it, and they continue to grow in their abilities, then we have neurological organization. And that can lead us, let's use mobility as an example, that can lead us from not being able to move much at all, except by reflex, to being able to coordinate our movements, to being able to coordinate them to propel us forward, to eventually push up and go gravity free, to eventually walk and run and kick a ball and do all kinds of you know beautiful things that human beings do with their bodies when they're neurologically organized. That's kind of an obvious example on the surface. And if that's not going well, that's pretty obvious, right? You know, kids who get stuck because of a brain injury. Um, and yeah, what's the difference between injury and damage? I write about this a lot on my blog. You know, if I, if, I, if I sprain my ankle, that's an injury. We expect it to get better, right? If I cut my finger, that's an injury. We expect it to get better. We talk about brain damage. Oh, feels very permanent, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. The way we label things has everything to do with what we believe about them and then what, and then what we do. Great point. So, right? But this neurological organization is pretty obvious, um, like on those physical mobility um, issues. But you know, the kids that I work with, and and I was telling you before we started the tape, you know, my daughter had some physical problems as well. Um, but we addressed a lot of those, and she improved. She kind of got stuck at this stage of development where she had some cognitive disabilities, and you know, there are kids out there who it's not as obvious that they're disorganized in parts of their brain that have to do with learning and reading. You know, that stuff all starts with being able to see the vision. Our visual um, development follows a certain order and our auditory being able to hear and understand that follows a certain order. And if something has happened because of a physical injury, kids drown and you know, fall off bicycles and, you know, things happen to hurt their, their brains. Things happen chemically as well. You know, we are watching, it's been predicted that in the next decade, at least one in three children will have autism, some form of wow. autism. That's sensory pathway disorganization. And um, we know that it, you can look at the pictures and the graphs. It tells it's a pretty clear story when we started polluting our food and spraying it with Roundup. I think Roundup's changing their name now because they know they're in trouble. Um, they've just been sold and glyphosate has a new name so they can use it somewhere else. You know, but so there are lots of ways to impact the brain and what it should be able to do. It's no longer able to do. So that is disorganization. Those neurons aren't working the way they should, but we can change that, right, Dean? 
Right. Amen. That's for sure. And, and, and I want to just, again, clarify for someone. So, and I'll just use my daughter as an example for a second. So Ella Claris, her name, she had a stroke on the womb. It was affected the midbrain, especially. And so mobility was a huge challenge. So in Ella Claris case, he put her on the floor on her stomach. And if she was a well child without that brain injury, she would start to move around and then eventually start to crawl and creep and stand and walk and run. And that would happen naturally. I mean, right. and, 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 and pretty much you put them on their stomach and that happens. Ella Claire, you know, we could have put her on her stomach from now until kingdom come and it wasn't going to happen. You know, she needed the stimulation. She needed stimulation with repetition with you know with frequency and intensity and duration in order to help her do things that a normal well child without that brain injury would 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 do and so in your case you know you, you with meningitis had certain effects there was certain injury that occurred and you were able through a program that was given to you by the Domans in, in this case, the Domans gave you a program that you were able to execute that in essence helped her do things she never would have done. I mean, that's kind of what we're talking about here. It is. And I love, you know, you say that she never would have done. And, you know, there are some people that say, well, how would you know? And there are a lot of people <laughs> say, oh, they outgrow it. Well, they don't outgrow it if you don't help them outgrow it. I mean, they're, you know, they don't outgrow it if you lock them in a closet. You know, we know, we know on the other end, you can deprive children of enough stimulation and opportunity to reduce. Right. Um, you know, can, can, I, yeah. can I jump in with a quote from the great Glenn Doman real quick? Because you say that it makes me laugh because Glenn Doman, I don't know if you remember this, but in his office, he had a stained glass and it said, I think it was in a different language, but it's but what it said was because of that kind of criticism they would get, his stained glass window said, this is the place where things that would have happened anyways happen. <laughs> Basically poking fun at the idea that the truth is the things wouldn't have happened anyways. I know that for a fact because I watched my daughter develop for the first two and a half years and I've watched her develop for the last 17 years. And it's a very different thing. The first two versus last 17. I'm sure you can concur with your first three or whatever it was versus the last 24. Uh, it, you know, we've seen it. We've seen the before and after, I guess, if you will. Um, yes. And the other thing, you know, I, this is almost, this is difficult for me to say. The other comparison I have, which I wish I didn't have, to be honest with you, is with her peers. Um, you know, those kids that were in physical therapy with her, um, they're not bike riding and doing gymnastics now. They're not, they're not at university. Wow. Yes. You know what I'm saying? So like, so yeah, yeah. you know, my daughter was hurt in the midbrain too, not clearly as, as um, significantly as your, your daughter. Um, so Haley had some physical um, coordination problems, but, but she was mobile. She was mobile and hyperactive and, you know, rather than immobile, but yes. Yeah, so it just all depends on which part of the brain, how much, um, and then what kind of opportunity and stimulation is available to get them through those blocks, right? right. Trillions of neurons waiting to come online. You know, my master's program, um, we looked at some of this. Um, and I, of course, I study it. I gobble it all up. This idea that, you know, stem cell research is telling us there are new neurons coming all the time mm -hmm. and they hang around waiting for a job. And if they don't get one, well, they, you know, they disappear again. And so all the neuroscience is telling us what you and I have just experienced, you know, on our living room floors <laughs> for right. years. Right? Yes. <laughs> and, 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 you know, it's, it's, it's amazing to me just from a big picture perspective, just hearing you talk. I mean, here we have this brain. I believe God created it. It's a miraculous thing. You know, this little, I don't know how much it weighs, but not much. Six pounds. How much? Six pounds. Six yeah. pounds. Okay. This little six yes. pound thing that's in, what it does is just absolutely miraculous. And the, and the truth is, from my perspective, we can learn about it, how it works. I mean, just like anything else, 
we can actually learn how the brain works and how, when it doesn't, what we can do to help it work. Because as Douglas Doman says, you know, we use this real small percentage of, of our brain. And so to be able to know what to do to help it rewire, re things that you know a lot more about than I do, but it is, is spectacular. Yeah, but you know what gets in the way of that, I think, from a professional, from the other professionals that I know, because I don't think neurologists who, you know, are prescribing phenobarbital and the drugs have changed now, of course, I don't, you know, I don't know all the new names, but, um, you know, they're not trying. I mean, they take an oath, first do no harm. Um, right. But you know what's different? There's a different perspective. There's a different view. And I think this happens for families too. I mean, some families embrace this the way you and I did. And some families, it, it just doesn't resonate with. And I, I've noticed it has a lot to do with how attached we get to those labels. I mean, some people really have a lot of investment in being, um, you know, an autism mom. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. I celebrate that, that is a, a, a difficult job. Um, but, but when we get really attached to those labels, like for ourselves or for our kids, it tends to sort of blind our vision, I think, to what mm -hmm. else might be possible. Um, and yes. so I think it's important, you know, because that for me, that, that label of autism is not a thing that that person will be forever. It's a stage of brain development. And do those kids need to be supported? Absolutely. Do we need to have places where the auditory um, stimulation doesn't drive them bonkers? Absolutely. Does society need to come on board and understand these neurodiverse individuals? And, you know, absolutely. But because that's out of respect for them, right? But I think if we want to take respect all the way, all the way, then we have to respect them enough to say, well, let's see if we can fix up some of these problems too. Right. Right. So let's see if we can get that brain to not be so sensitive to sounds. And doesn't that really respect that individual because it allows them to live a life that's pain free? You know, right. having auditory sensitivity um, is a painful way to live. And so instead of just focusing on their behavior, teaching them to potty train or teaching them, you know, if we get their auditory sensitivity fixed up, they're not as terrified of the sounds in the bathroom. Right. Yes. So, that's, you know, for me, that's where it is. It's that's my love and respect for that child and those parents that are doing everything they can for that child and yeah. just not understanding. Yeah. You, and, know, and, what's and, in their brain. you mentioned <laughs> the auditory pathway and, and I know autism, autistic children, children with autism tend to have that particular sensitivity and it affects the auditory pathway for some reason, who knows, but I, but speaking of that, I mean, I remember when Ella Claire, we, we would get on elevators mm -hmm. and it was terrifying for her. Oh. I mean, the, the sensation of moving up and down, she would just panic, right? And so we could have just lived with that. Oh, she's brain injured, you know? Or <laughs> in our, what happened to us is we did this program with the Doman folks, and which is at domaninternational.org, by the way. And through that program, all of a sudden, I remember we were somewhere and we got on an elevator and she didn't freak out. And I was just like, wait a second. She's supposed to freak out. She didn't freak out. Why? Because the program, we treated the brain. We could have just put up with the symptoms, put up with the elevator problem the rest of our life, or it, which is, I'm sure, terrifying, was terrifying for her. Right. Or we don't have to, you know? I mean, and again, not that we bat, I don't, nobody bats a thousand, nobody bats a, you know, a hundred percent, but, but I, the point is, I think you're right. I think the labels sometimes can cause us to put up with stuff that we don't have to put up with. And people don't know, you know, people, I didn't know. Right. I didn't know there was something we could do, you know, um, well, I, first of all, please give our best to Haley. What a spectacular journey she's been on, you've been on. Uh, we're going to put your website up on the screen. We only have a, a minute here, uh, surprisingly, but I want to put your website on the screen. So parents who are watching this that have, you know, uh, from reading disabilities to, you know, learning disabilities, developmental issues, certainly uh, DarcyHawkshurst.com, which is on your screen, um, real solutions for your child's learning. I would encourage you to reach out to Darcy. 
on the more kind of severe side, which is kind of where we landed with a major stroke, but domaninternational.org, D-O-M-A-N, international.org is where they are. Uh, so in terms of if you're dealing with, uh, you know, a severe brain injury, I would, I would point you to, to both places. Darcy knows what she's talking about, obviously, as a mom and also a, an expert in this area. So Darcy, congrats on what you've accomplished. And I'm looking forward to reading your book. Send us your book when you get it. Maybe we'll, maybe we'll have you back on. Oh, yeah. We'll talk about the book. Oh, yeah. It'd be great. Great fun. Awesome. Well, thank you for coming on. Say hi to Haley for us. And, um, and congratulations on everything that's happened for you guys. It's a beautiful story. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dean. All right. We'll see you next time.